that it's great to be able to stand up and tell everyone you've got a wonderful message to bring. And I have. But in case I don't do it very well, this is the message. Jesus accepts every one of us, so we should accept each other. Okay, so you haven't got to listen to the rest now. Okay, you've got the message already. Uh, my name is Chris Reveille. Um, welcome again to those online, because I've got something special to say about online later on as well. Um, Lucy, my wife, we've been in the church about two and a half years now, but Lucy has always been a great fan of Inspector Morse. And um, if you could uh, show up the picture there, here is Lewis, actually, rather than Morse, and uh, his sidekick, Hathaway. And I don't know, do you know who the chap is with a stick walking along? Anyone know? Well, I'll tell you. It, thank you. Yes, it's Colin Dexter who wrote the Morse stories. And he was an author, not an actor, but he liked every so often to give himself a cameo appearance in the films that were being made. And what we've just read, had read to us from Matthew, is Matthew's cameo appearance in his own gospel. So he wrote the gospel of Matthew, and this little bit here is telling us just the bit he wants to tell us about his story. And this is what we're going to look at today. Just to remind you of the context, if we could look at the list of the different uh, talks we're having. And we're halfway through. And this one is called Unlikely Recruits. Now, I don't know uh, if you used to play in the playground and if you used to go through that excruciating thing where people would be picking sides. Do you know that one? I'll have him, I'll have her, I'll, that game. Now, maybe you were very fast or strong or skillful or whatever it was, and you always got picked first. Or maybe you were always picked last. Or maybe somewhere in between. But just think for a moment, what did it feel like to be picked? What was it like when someone called out your name? Or what was it like if you weren't picked? Just think about that for a second. So here's the outline of what we're going to cover in the talk today. We're going to meet Matthew. We're going to talk about the wrong sort. We're going to think about Jesus' unlikely recruits. And then there's an opportunity for us to respond to what we've heard. And I think actually there may be individuals that want specific prayer. Praise God, that's always available. But I actually think today this is something for each one of us. There is something here for each one of us to take into account. So let's meet Matthew. Matthew puts himself into his gospel and he tells us that he was a tax collector. That meant he was probably very rich but very, very unpopular because he had to collaborate with the Romans who were the governing force in Israel. And he was almost certainly skimming money on the side as he went through his business. He probably sat, what it tells us, he was sitting in a booth uh, on the shorefront and people he would collect tax from included uh, fishermen. Does that ring a bell? Peter and Andrew, James and John were probably regularly being ripped off by this guy, Matthew. Matthew was no one's first pick in a popularity contest. He was someone that most people would probably seek to avoid, though there were others like him and there were some low lowlifes who undoubtedly could associate with him as well. And this is what we read. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. How about that as an utterly dramatic change? There he is, taking his, in his day job, just sitting there with not many friends, and then suddenly Jesus picks Matthew calling him by name. What did he know about Jesus at that stage? Well, he was from uh, where Jesus was living in Capernaum. And so he'd heard some of his teaching probably. And he'd almost certainly uh, seen perhaps the odd miracle. And just before this, as David reminded us in the exciting things going on in the chapter, just before Jesus calls him, Jesus has not only healed a man who was paralytic, but he's used it as evidence that he has the authority to forgive sins. 
And so there is Matthew, and Jesus calls him, and Matthew knows that Jesus can forgive sins. Last week, Tom was preaching on counting the cost. He said, count the cost, put first things first, grasp the day, seize the day. And that's what Matthew does. We don't read there was a long debate. We don't read he handed over to the person who was next on shift on the booth. It says that Jesus called him and he got up and he followed. And Jesus picked Matthew for an amazing mission. He becomes an apostle, a witness of the death and resurrection of Jesus. He becomes an evangelist. Tradition says he went into the Caucasus and there is where he was martyred for his faith. And there's a, a place in Kyrgyzstan that's got some relics that claim to be from him. But also he was picked, I suspect, because Jesus knew that he was fluent in Greek as well as Hebrew and Aramaic. And so he was an ideal person to write down the biography of Jesus that we're studying as we go through it now. But let's be honest, uh, his friends and indeed himself were not really the respectable people in society. They weren't like us as a nice 1030 congregation. They weren't even like messy church. They were people that were considered outside of ordinary society, the collaborators, the promiscuous, the corrupt, the poor, sinners. And these are the people that Matthew invites Jesus to go and meet. Well, before we get onto that bit, let's think about the wrong sort, because it's a phrase we use. However uh, open-minded we are, we sometimes talk about, oh, they're not the right sort for us, which is a terrible thing to say, but it's a phrase, if we don't use it, we hear others using it. Matthew, was he the wrong sort? Well, if you'd asked Peter and Andrew, James and John, they undoubtedly would have said yes. He's a corrupt thief. He's unreliable. Or think a bit later in the Acts of the Apostles, Saul of Tarsus. Was he the wrong sort? Well, ask Ananias. Because when God says to Ananias, you go and pray with this chap, Saul of Tarsus, Ananias takes it upon himself to remind God that God's a bit informed and out of touch. And he seems to have failed to realize that Saul is persecuting the church. And God just says to him, go. Saul was who God had chosen. I watched a film recently, The, the Jesus Revolution. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Has anyone seen The Jesus Revolution? One or two have. Thank you. And this is a great story. It's very good about a bunch of hippies that become Christians and start going to a church. They probably had a, you know, a dull, boring old vicar like Sai and uh, with a handful of people there. And, and what happens? All these hippies start coming in. There's a wonderful scene when the, the, the leadership of the old church, the old members of the church, say to Chuck Smith, who's the pastor, they say to him, they're coming to church and they're even coming in bare feet and they're ruining the carpet. That was a group of people that were the wrong sort. Or, uh, and I've got to think about this as well, with regards to when I was actually um, uh, from about the age of 13 in the church I grew up in. And in that church, we started to run an outreach coffee bar. And we had, it was an old gospel hall. So if anyone knows gospel halls, it's not beautiful like this. They totally lack any artistic merits. It was a big square hall with a roof on the top. So to make it a bit more attractive, we hung black drapes around all the walls where normally the gospel service and the breaking of bread services were held. And we put colored things all over them and flashing lights. And we called the church to pray as we were reaching out to the skinheads and the greasers, the bikers, who all came along to this and my grandmother walked in took one look and said witchcraft and stormed out and refused to pray for us or can't do anything because the skinheads and the greasers that we wanted to come were the wrong sort as far as she was concerned not the sort of people that God wanted in his kingdom or even recently, you might have heard of a famous celebrity who's just been baptised in the Thames, despite his terrible reputation and many things he's accused of doing. Is he the right sort? Well, what's clear, it seems to me, is that God wants us 
to accept one another. That doesn't mean to say if someone's doing things wrong that that's right or in any way that we can uh, accept that. But it does mean that we're called to accept one another because Christ has accepted us. We need to be as wise as serpents, but as peaceful of doves as we deal with people who are different to us, who come in. But we are not called to judge who is a Christian. That is something only God knows. Do you know, this really does apply to us as a church. I'm not suggesting there are many criminals here, though some of us might be. But I do know as a church how much this church has been changing over the last few years. And some people here might feel, oh, it's changed beyond the church I used to know. Others, you might feel it's great. We've just arrived. It's going really well. And I believe that in St. Michael's, we need to learn to accept and to encourage and to trust each other's differences, to be able to recognize that God works in different ways for different people. Now, just to show that, I'm going to try and say a sentence that only some of you will understand. And that may not be the Cantonese speakers if I get it wrong. So here we go. Hat yan, ngo de do hai ju ye so ge duk dik dai hing si moi. Thank you, thank you. Now, I, I believe that Tom might have a gift of tongue, so can you just interpret that for us? What I said, I hope, what I said, I hope was, oh, people are moving out now. I've said the terrible thing. I must have used the wrong word. Um, what, what I think I said was that Christians, whether we're Chinese, whether we are English, whether we're from any background, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, all brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And we need to learn to get to know each other. And, and the word that Jesus, uh, the scripture uses when it says we accept one another is the accept, which is not just to tolerate, but it's to engage with, to love, to be interested in each other. And so my first challenge today, we're getting not near the end yet, we've got a bit to go, but the first challenge today is to say, when we're having coffee today, why don't we talk to someone we haven't talked to before and actually start to get to know people who may be a bit different to us, start to talk to other people. It's lovely we've got our friends here. We can speak to them next week. This week, would you mind talking to someone else? Um, but Jesus goes round to Matthew's house and they have this great big banquet because Matthew's invited those people that will come to his house. In fact, if you put on a banquet, people often do come. And so they're coming along. There are other tax collectors, there are other sinners and the respectable people look on and they are horrified that Jesus, who's supposed to be a rabbi, is mixing with the riffraff. And there he is. And Jesus knows what they're thinking. And he says this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the righteous, not to, sorry, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus knew he was being criticized, but of course, he also knew how silly the criticism was. Imagine that there is a doctor and they're getting criticized for mixing with sick people. How crazy would that be? And Jesus says, look, I have come as a saviour to mix with those who are sinners who need to be saved. It's, it's interesting. There's a, some phrases we used recently, believing, behaving, becoming. And the journeys we take to become Christians are all different. Some of us believe absolutely first before we've even met any Christians. I met someone just recently. She may even be watching this now online. And she had had an encounter with Jesus on her own and now is sort of finding out about it. She knows that he is God. It was revealed to her remarkably. She believed first, but all the stuff about lifestyle change is going on now. And she doesn't even yet go to a church because there isn't really one where she is. Another situation, completely different. There was a lovely man in Hong Kong when we were in the church there. And he was a steward at the Sha Tin race course. And uh, he was in his 50s and he lived in alone and his whole life was horse racing. And he became a Christian. 
And um, it was, I sat there, my, my Cantonese was a bit better those days. I sat in this prayer meeting when he shared something very clearly and I didn't understand a word of it and I could see the pastor was quite flustered and some of the others were sort of giggling a bit and so on. And apparently he stood up and he'd said that he believed that God had told him who was going to win the four o'clock in the race that Saturday afternoon. So if the church gave him all the collection money on Sunday, he could put it on the horse and this would be multiplied many times over. He believed in Jesus. He belonged to the church, but his lifestyle and behavior perhaps hadn't quite caught up. So that's how it is, isn't it? Jesus calls all sorts of unlikely people. He calls you. He calls me. We're unlikely because what he says is, I don't want sacrifice. That's us trying to follow the rituals. I want mercy, love and care for my people. And who wants a humble heart that recognizes that we need to be forgiven. And only Jesus can do that and put us right with God. So as I finish, three responses. The first one is this. Follow me, Jesus said, and Matthew did it straight away. Maybe someone here today, you've heard God say to you, now is the time to become a Jesus follower. The promise is this, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that also means that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If Jesus is saying to you today, follow me, take that opportunity, seize the day, follow Jesus. He will forgive you. He will bless you. Secondly, Alpha and Kintsugi. Matthew held the first ever recorded Alpha class. He had a big meal of people round and he introduced them to Jesus. That's what happens at Alpha. And of course, all his friends came along to hear. This church runs Alpha regularly. And we're running it again on the 1st and 2nd, starting again with a taster on the 1st and 2nd of October. And so do now start. You've got three months to pray for someone that you could invite and bring along to Alpha. Because anyone and everyone can be a recruit in Jesus' gang. And I mentioned the first, so the second is the meal on the Wednesday evening starting at seven o'clock. But the online is important too because some people can't get there at seven o'clock to St. Michael's, particularly if you've got work colleagues who live the other side of Bristol or you've got family who don't live nearby. So another option is at eight o'clock on Zoom on Tuesday evening starting on the 1st of October online alpha and whether someone's stuck at home because they can't get out or they're traveling a lot because of their work if they can get onto a computer at eight o'clock they could join zoom too and so do please pray that God puts on your heart someone you could bring or invite there are people uh, out in the last few alpha courses this is where you can start stretching your mind who have joined from Spain and Zambia and Holland as well as London and the Midlands and so on so that breaks down that barrier and you can come to and bring your friend or relative with you. And Kintsugi, I don't think that's online, but that can be similar. There might be someone who is needing that healing, needing that opportunity to address issues. Why not invite them? So in a moment, perhaps you can pray and just think about who God is putting on your heart to invite along to Alpha or Kintsugi. And then pray over the next two to three months that you will have the opportunity to invite them and to bring them along. And finally, as we do finish, and maybe the band can come up now, ready to lead us into our final song. Church is meant to be a foretaste of what lies ahead in eternal life. That doesn't mean that every church service is one that will go on forever and ever in heaven because that will put you right off, I'm sure. But if you think about what is there in heaven, it is we are a microcosm, a picture of what that might be like. In Revelation 5, this song is sung to Jesus. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. 
So let's join in praise of the one who redeemed us by his blood shed on the cross. And let's recognize in our church a microcosm of the new heaven and the new earth where Jesus' followers of every tribe and tongue and people and nation are worshipping the one that's rescued us and who has picked us, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're old or young, male or female, whatever our educational or occupational status, whether we're used to being picked first or last, let us give thanks to the one who has said to us, follow me. And let us accept one another as Christ Jesus has accepted us to the praise of our wonderful God. Amen. Amen.